Okay, everyone, good afternoon. Welcome. You can take your seats. So welcome all. I'm Paul Baxter. I'm Leaders Director of Education and Training. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon for our careers event. A great lineup of speakers from ASDA, the Bank of England and Channel 4. And we'll have some time for a panel discussion at the end. And then there's some networking buffet outside, probably around 5.30. So a few quick housekeeping announcements. We're not expecting any fire alarms. If one does go off, obviously there's the entrance here that you came in. There's also two exits at the back. And we just need to go downstairs to level four onto the ground and assemble on Clarendon Road. If you need the toilet at any point, if you go back towards the stairwell, they're just on the corridor on the right. Hopefully no one will need first aid, but if they do, just one flag myself or an organiser and we'll arrange for that. You'll notice some pieces of paper on your desk referring to our Padlet for Q&A. So the way we're going to do the question and answer session, if you can log in to Padlet using the QR code or the web link, and then just post your questions, I'll monitor them and I'll be picking out questions to answer at the end. And then hopefully our speakers might have a little bit of time to answer some questions offline after today. And if you do want to chat with them, of course, feel free to come and chat with the speakers during the networking. The session's being recorded. We plan to post on YouTube later this week. And there is a photographer present to take some publicity shots. If that's a problem for anyone, just come and speak to us at the end. We'll make sure you're not on any photos. Please, if you can have your phones on silent, though don't turn them off because we want you to post your questions in the Padlet, as I spoke about earlier. Okay, so just a couple of slides from me about the Institute for Data Analytics, then we'll get to the main event. So what's LEADER? So LEADER exists to support um, data science across the university, the region and beyond, to grow it and make sure it's as impactful uh, as it can be. The way that we do that is by bringing people together in events like this, by bringing people and other resources together to enable that impact to take place. So we're organised into three broad areas. So my colleague Alex Franges, our Director of Research and Innovation, so he helps support collaborative bids for uh, research funding across the university. So that's me, Paul Baxter, I'm as I say, Director of Education and Training, so what do we do? We support and nurture our affiliated MSc programmes across the university and centres for doctoral training. We encourage CPD through uh, the short courses offered by um, uh, the Centre for um, Consumer Data Research. And we organise seminars and events like the one you're at today. There's also my fellow uh, co-director, Roy, who looks after our research technology, so the sort of infrastructure, uh, both physical and virtual, for enabling secure research on campus and off campus. So what can LEADER do? So LEADER has a physical space up on level 11 of this building for encouraging people to come together. We have a range of staff, including the analytics team for supporting research bids and others who you'll have met today, Kim and Hannah and others. And as I mentioned, we have the infrastructure to support research in secure research environments. Key contacts, I won't go through all of these, probably the key ones for today. I think some of you are already here from our data scientist development programme. That's for uh, growing future data scientists. If you're interested in that, I can put you in touch with Kylie. Our Centres for Doctoral Training. Perhaps some people are, are here from the Centres for Doctoral Training in AI and in societies. If you're thinking about PhD, they're good people to talk to. Other ways to get involved with LEADER. Join our communities and our programmes. Uh, those who are already on our mailing list will have had contact from Hannah recently, our marketing manager, about getting more involved with programmes and communities and sitting beneath those we have a range of study groups and other groups that you can get involved with there's much more I could say but I want to get to the main event so if you want to ask more about the Institute for Data Analytics come find me during the networking I'll be happy to chat and point you in the right direction otherwise I'm very pleased to invite our first set of speakers and we have four speakers I think Laura, Jess, Nazir and Tom who are going to talk to us about data science careers in ASDA. Cool. Um, so, 
Uh, we're going to give a brief overview of sort of data science at ASDA, recruitment, etc., and then we'll just get into a bit more detail about some specific projects. So within ASDA, there's kind of um, four main data teams, um, and we're here today representing two of those. So there's the sort of ASDA tech IT side of things, which Naz and Tom um, are within that sort of area. Um, Amplify, which is essentially a team that looks at our rewards program. So I don't know how well you know ASDA as a business, but we've recently launched a rewards app, and that rewards app is obviously built on a plethora of data and the ability to analyze that and to dedicate a team that looks at that. Um, myself and Laura are within a part of the business called ADS, which is Analytical and Decision Services. Um, it's a bit of an obscure name, but basically well, there's a few different teams within that that do various types of business intelligence, data science. Uh, I'm personally in a geospatial specialist team, um, lots of different areas that we look at across the business. And then George, which is uh, quite a new team that's been established, specifically looking at the George clothing brand and sort of the data uh, and insight behind that. Um, so in terms of recruitment pieces and data science within ASDA, the um, previously has been a, a graduate scheme, a dedicated data science graduate scheme. It's currently on pause while the HR team kind of review opportunities within the business, what that could look like going forwards, etc. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways of sort of working within data science within ASDA. So we offer a number of apprenticeships and that's from sort of level three qualifications all the way through to master's degrees. Um, and you obviously work while you learn. Um, and there are constantly a number of entry-level jobs available on, on the ASDA Jobs website. So I'd encourage you to go and look on there. Even if you're not looking to work at ASDA, I think my recommendation would be to kind of look at those job specs, understand the skills and requirements of working in, in a business like ASDA and uh, start to build up your sort of portfolio skills whilst you're still in education. Um, on that sort of uh, vein of thinking, so in terms of career development, one of the big benefits of working at a big company like Asta is that there's a broad range of roles available. Um, so none of us kind of get pigeonholed into one thing. You can move around. I've personally been in four or five different teams now over the last three years, um, and you can really get exposure to lots of different areas. Um, so that's kind of like a big, a big perk of working in a large company is that you're not just in one single part of the business. You get to work with lots of different parts of the business. Um, I'll let Laura, who's actually a data scientist, talk a bit more about the skill. Um, yeah, so from a data science perspective, um, there's a few different kind of skill sets that we generally look for. So there's the technical side, um, which I'm sure you're aware of. We predominantly in our team uh, use uh, Azure and Databricks um, and work in Python, but we also utilize PySpark and R and quite a lot of SQL as well. Um, and there's also the kind of standard things you would expect, so quite stats heavy, uh, machine learning. We do a lot of time series forecasting. Um, and the projects that we work on. Um, and then thing, the other things that we think are particularly important are around um, understanding like, the, the life cycle of um, data science products. Um, so how do you get from um, initial kind of proof of concept all the way to implementing something um, that sits within a um, production process. Um, and then things around kind of software engineering principles, so making sure that you're working in an agile way, um, you've got version control, those kinds of things. Um, and then it's also really important to account for the kind of non-technical side of things. So obviously we can build a great model, but if we can't tell people what, what it's about and communicate that well, then it doesn't go anywhere. So um, building skills around kind of influencing, telling the story, being able to visualize um, what it is that you're uh, finding and what you've created um, is really important um, in those kind of roles. Um, so... We've rattled through that so we can get onto a bit more of the, uh, the meaty stuff around this. So just a bit of background on, on kind of how we've got to where we are today. Um, I know many of you are from different stages of your educational career, but uh, the point we're just trying to emphasise here is that there's no single path to getting into a role in data science. So um, I personally have a degree in economics from Leeds, um, and I've worked in a number of different analytical and insight roles um, for the police, um, a social care charity connected to the Department of Health, and now obviously at ASDA. Um, and in my time at ASDA, as I say, I've moved around quite a bit. So I started off in corporate strategy, um, which was all to do with five-year planning. But six weeks into my job, uh, COVID happened. So I got sent home and the five-year plan got torn up um, and thrown in the bin a little bit. Um, so we started to look more at you know, the impacts of COVID, what we're seeing in the data in terms of trends. Um, so as you probably remember, toilet paper just disappeared off the shelves. So we could then look at that data and say, right, toilet paper sales are starting to go through the roof again. Does that mean a second wave is coming? Is there more panic? buying coming, sort of trends like that that you can see in the data. Um, for various business reasons in terms of the structure of ASDA, there was, there was a bit of a change of direction um, and one of our key pillars of the strategy was around partnerships and business development um, and I was moved sort of into a role within that team. 
So that was when I sort of took a step back from the data a little bit and started actually executing this on the ground for the customers. Um, so a big part of this was bringing in uh, third party businesses into stores uh, to deliver more uh, customer missions under one roof, so selling different businesses' products essentially. Um, was promoted within that to a managerial position, sort of then actually owning those partnerships, dealing with those third party businesses and actually executing it on the ground. But I was kind of hungry for the data, so moved back into um, a data role in the geospatial and market team, which is part of our sort of wider data science function. But as I say, we're, we're geospatial specialists, so we do everything around sort of um, mapping right down from postcode, really local level data, all the way up to UK national level stuff. And we do that in partnership with various parts of the business so one of our main partners is property we're looking to expand our retail estate at the moment so opening new stores but where do you open them why would you open them in a certain area and how big is that opportunity and they're the kind of questions that we're answering with the data that we own um, I, as I say, I'm not a data analyst uh, by, by training as such, um, but I work very closely with data analysts and manage a team of analysts myself um, who are doing that sort of more um, hardcore coding data science side of things. And then my role is more about, to Laura's point, telling the story. So nothing goes anywhere in a business unless you can bring people on the journey with you. So a big part of my job is taking all of that really good, clever stuff that the guys are doing and then actually selling it back to the business and explaining what the tangible actions are and what change that can drive. So that's kind of a big part of that sort of next next level of role. Um, and then I've got, I guess, quite a different background to Jeff. So I uh, did a maths degree um, at this uni um, and wasn't really sure what I wanted to go into, um, wasn't really aware of data science when I was studying maths um, and sort of landed upon um, a placement year uh, in the Department of Health in operational research, which kind of opened my eyes to to data and analytics generally, um, which then led me into kind of multiple different roles in different industries. So since then, um, I've worked across kind of travel, insurance, and now in Asda in retail. Um, so I've been in Asda now for just over a year, um, and we've been able to. I've been involved in kind of five different projects so far. So it shows kind of the um, opportunities that you get, I suppose, within um, our teams and the kind of scope for um, being involved in different kinds of problems. Um, so personally, I've been involved with um, things like understanding supply chain forecasting, so how, how do we optimise how much stock we send to stores and what kind of factors might influence um, demand that we have for particular products. Um, things around how we price products when they go into markdown, so how much discount do we give them. Um, and I'll talk through that a little bit more um, later on. Um, similarly in pr promotions, and then um, more recently we're looking at things like how do we optimise space within stores. Um, across all of our different types of, of uh, products to make sure we've got the right uh, volume of stock and space allocated, essentially. Um, so I was quite naive when uh, I first um, joined ASDA in terms of the different um, decisions that happen uh, within our organisation to ultimately get products into a store at the, in front of customers. Um, and luckily, there's, there's a huge number of... Um, decisions that get made along the process which means that there's lots of opportunity and really involved uh, really interesting problems for us to get involved with um, so start right at the beginning um, of how how do we get products into a store that people can can then buy um, so initially uh, people are making decisions around things like what are the products that we want to sell um, and how much should we be selling them for what price do we sell them for um, how do we minimize the cost of those products so we can make as much I suppose profit on those as possible. Um, how much space should we allocate to those products? And that um, is done in multiple different layers. So things like which products should we put into promotions um, that should get the kind of space at the end of our aisles, which is kind of predominant space really in front of customers. Um, and how much space should we allocate, uh, for example, across like things like um, fresh produce versus frozen versus clothing and so on. Um, to make sure we've got the right allocation of space. Um, and then that also goes all the way down to, once you've decided, for example, uh, you've got an aisle of vegetables, how do you then decide how much of that aisle should be bananas, for example, versus carrots or apples or whatever it might be? Um, so there's, there's a huge layer of decisions that go into that. And then once we're at that point where we know what products we want to sell, how much space they have, we've then got to figure out um, how we get those products into the store. So um, supply chain teams then work out how much uh, stock do we need to order and when does that need to be ordered to make sure it's in the right place at the right time. Um, and then how do we get that product into store? So what's the routing it should take from depots into shops? Um, and what's the right setup? 
for that to happen? Um, and then how do we make that happen in reality? So how many um, colleagues do we need in our depots to service that demand? How many trucks do we need to be able to transport all of those products around the network? Um, and then ultimately, how do we then execute that within our stores? So how many colleagues do we need, for example, to work in our shops? Um, and what's the right um, kind of shifts for them to work at different times of day and so on? Um, so that happens as like one big kind of planning cycle. And then once that's happened, the send teams that kind of review how well that worked. And that kind of gets fed back to the planning cycle. And it's kind of an iterative process from there to make sure we keep improving and refining what we're doing um, so that we're continuously getting better and better, um, utilising all of that data that we have. Um, so I mentioned earlier uh, one of the projects that I've been involved with um, was around George Markdown optimization. Um, so to explain what Markdown is, um, products within George, our clothing business, are generally on sale for kind of 8 to 16 weeks. Um, they're quite seasonal items and change throughout the year, so we don't keep them on sale all year round. Um, once the product gets to the end of its kind of life, we then want to clear that stock, so we don't want it taking up space in stores anymore. Um, so we have to figure out what discount do we give to that item to get it kind of sold, essentially. Um, within the George team, we had quite a basic process um, where the traders essentially just marked down every product at 50%, regardless of how much stock we had left um, and how well it was selling. Um, and as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of opportunity to use data to kind of tweak that and make that um, decision much, uh, kind of vary the, the discount based on the product um, individually. So um, we set up a project to make two kind of recommendations to um, the George team. So that was identifying um, products that could have what we called a redundant markdown, so they didn't need to be discounted at all. Um, and they would just clear their stock at uh, the, the kind of full retail price. Um, and then reducible markdowns where we could give um, products a 20 or 30% discount. Um, and that would sell at the um, expected rate, we would be able to clear the stock. Um, but obviously we'd uh, improve our kind of profit based on that because we give a lower discount. Um, and you can see the two charts um, with examples of this. So the top one shows you an example where um, the sales of the product really, really low um, until we put it into that markdown uh, kind of mid-June um, of that year. And suddenly the sales spike massively. Um, so that was a product that actually really needed that 50% discount. Um, whereas if you look at the chart at the bottom, um, the products were selling pretty well. Um, it started to obviously tail off as we kind of run out of stock in certain stores and so on. Um, but it didn't need the level of discount that um, the traders kind of used with the existing process. So there's, uh, there was a real opportunity to start to optimise from there. So um, when we got involved looking at the data, there was um, a lot of thought went into how we would then build a model to um, solve this problem. The biggest challenge that we encountered was how do you forecast sales of a particular product when that product has only been on sale for two weeks? So you know very little about how well it's selling, what the demand for that item is, um, and what do you use to, to do that forward projection. Um, so the way that we tackled that, we've used um, a light GBM time series model. Um, that builds out a forecast uh, for our baseline sales, so when we don't give any discount to that product, um, what do we expect it to sell over a certain number of weeks? Um, and we've used features, things like the product attributes, so um, what kind of item is it? Is it a t-shirt versus um, jeans, for example? Uh, is it a product that is linked with a particular brand, so is it Disney? Um, does it have a particular character? Those kinds of things. Um, the selling price, um, how well it's sold to date, so if we've got two weeks worth of data, can we compare it to other products that have similar um, trajectory in that two weeks? Um, things like time series, seasonality features, so time of year, um, those kinds of features. And then things like stock, so is the item actually in our stores? Um, so we can get sales of if we had any issues with that that might have impacted how well sales are going. Um, and then we also, alongside that, discount, uh, alongside that um, forecast, uh, baseline sales, we then do a similar forecast for the uplift. So how do we expect sales to vary if we've given it a 20 or 30 percent discount versus a 50 percent discount? And then we can compare the difference between those two um, to understand what sales would be like at the end of the markdown period. Um, and we run that over 5,000 products every week. 
Um, and then getting that model into a production process, we followed a um, kind of proof of concept initially. So we developed um, a kind of test and control approach where we split products into two groups. Um, the test one, we followed the recommendations um, that were coming out of the model with the uh, 20 and 30 percent discounts, and then the control group where we gave a full 50 percent discount, and we could compare the um, kind of impact of the two to make sure that the recommendations that were coming out of the model were accurate and giving us uh, good results. Um, so we carried that process out over a four-month period of running those those test and control trials, um, and every month, generally, it was around three to 500 products um, were flagged as the kind of redundant and reducible um, items where we could generate extra um, kind of revenue from those those products um, and ultimately that ended up with uh, around one and a half million pounds benefit and so over a year we were estimating then about six to nine million pounds um, of extra benefit from quite a simple kind of change. Cool, so we're going to hand over to the, uh, the tech guys. Hi everybody, my name is Nasser Hussain, you can call me Nas for short, Tom uh, is in my team as well. I'm the data science manager for uh, DIA which is ASDA technology, um, I've been with ASDA almost two years. Um, just a bit of background, um, I'm a late entrant to data science, I uh, embarked on a masters in my early 40s and uh, then came in, you know, uh, made my way into data science. Um, I've worked for a national utility company in Scotland, worked for a fintech before coming to ASDA. Uh, Tom is part of one of our graduate schemes. Uh, Tom's been with us for two and a half years now. Yeah. Um, and you know, Tom and I have been working together for the best part of the year. So we're gonna just go over our sample project, a little bit more detail on space optimization. The purpose is not to uh, give you a lecture on theory. The purpose is to show you that within a data science role, uh, research and science are pretty much a given, as in like we expect you to research your solutions. And we, as part of our day-to-day -day job, when we're presented with a challenge, we refer back to that, what we've been trained at, at university. Um, so we're going to talk about space optimization. And is that this? Sorry, let's get the buttons right. Is that this one? Technology. Yeah, work in tech. So, uh, d just a general uh, explanation. What's optimization? Optimization is basically the, ang the action of making the best out of a possible situation. Um, generally, you're looking to minimise or maximise uh, to achieve an optimal goal. And what we mean by this is, are you planning? the shortest route, so you're looking to minimise. Are you planning to maximise your revenue? So you're looking for a maximum output, what we call um, the objective function. And a typical sort of example of maximising output would be, as Laura mentioned earlier on, how do we maximise our revenues in ASTA? Um, so, you know, if you go and research a typical example of maximum revenue or profit, uh, the several... Uh, examples out there in terms of production, if you're a steel manufacturer, you might consider, shall I produce a number of X number of gearboxes, X number of clutches, given the finite number of resources I have, man hours, um, the amount of steel, the amount of uh, machinery hours, etc. And vice versa, if you're uh, a manufacturer of uh, wooden products, you know, how many tables and chairs should I put together uh, and what's the optimal solution? So for us, it can be as simple as uh, how much shelf space should we give to apples and pears or how much shelf space should we give to ladies' blouses versus bench trousers, etc. Um, so within uh, optimization, we use a linear programming technique. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to represent complex relationships through linear functions. And we identify the minimum and the maximum optimum points. So in this case, we're looking for a maximum revenue. So effectively, we can interpret we can interpret it like this, that complex relationships are identified into linear relationships. Um, and the components of 
a standard linear programming challenge is that there's got to be an object, objective function. So, as I mentioned before, for us it's maximising revenue. And the decision variables are those variables that you're going to manipulate. You know, you're going to increase, decrease. And it normally comes with a set of constraints. You'll set a set of boundaries, minimums, maximum, uh, limited space, resources. And one other thing that exists within linear programming is that the values tend to be non-negative. So, essentially what we're trying to do is, if we consider this um, uh, graph here, taken from the encyclopedia, um, there's, this is a two-constraint model. So, that's just two, two constraints that are put on there, and we're trying to calculate a feasible region within there for the optimal solution. Now, if you imagine that type of graph with 30, 40, 50 constraints, that feasible region becomes very difficult to calculate, and we need to leverage the power of computers and processors. You know? um, and the method that we've used within the linear programming method is simplex method. And what we do is the machine actually uses an iterative process whereby it ascertains the most feasible solution using that feasible uh, region. And it, it's worked out by using a set of equations within that matrix and it just keeps iterating, 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 and iterating until it gets, achieves that feasible region. And what we're looking to do is we're, consti we're, we're consistently manipulating those decision variables, as I've mentioned. So these are the variables that you can you know, tweak to achieve that objective function. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, the constraints of how far we should go in terms of minimum and maximum, those are the boundaries that we try and keep uh, um, those uh, variables within. Um, so we've used this for George clothing uh, prior to the data science team coming on board at George. And I'm going to pass over to Tom, who's going to explain the trials and projects that we've done uh, at George. And uh, thank you for your time. There we go. Hi all, uh, I'm Tom Lucky. I'm a data scientist at ASTA, being previously um, been studying maths at, uh, here at Uni of Leeds. Uh, yeah, I've came <coughs> off the grad scheme in September and I'm now a data scientist. So, um, yeah, I'm going to take you through the various trials that we've done for this. So, we've done three, three trials um, over a various, various amount of stores. Well, we started with five stores then moved up to 91, and then our final one was 203. So in our first first solution, it was just trying to just basically just make sure it works. So we we did all of our prep in Excel to kind of find the lower and the upper limit for the for each space department and each store, and then solved that in um, in Python to output the results. Uh, then uh, then due to the uh, success of that, we moved on to uh, 90 stores and th this solution was for the summer of 2022 <coughs> so I think it was from uh, I think kind of June until October or something like that uh, th there we um, we prepared or it was a more complex solution so we needed to use old tricks to get all of the uh, data together and then we we worked out our final output in Python using the uh, pulp package in that we had quite a lot of uh, business limitations. So because uh, there was already a business plan and they'd already bought the stock, we couldn't make large moves in relation to, uh, to what had been bought already. So for example, uh, if you doubled the amount of men's slippers men's space, then you might have the same amount of stock, but, over, but spread over like double the amount. So you could have quite empty uh, shelves after a while. So we had yeah, so we had to limit we had to limit that to moving only maximum of fifty percent up and down for each uh, space department overall. So this this meant that um, in relation to the feasible re region diagram that Naz was showing earlier, that when it was in thirty or so dimensions, that the more limitations you have, the smaller it would be. So that made it more difficult. 
uh, we we all that we then moved on to our third trial, which was the two hundred and three stores, which is which is now live. So that started in the middle of March of this year and is finishing in June, where we should be getting some hopefully good results in July. And so in that we've actually got a new new limitation where um, where because there is not that much staff time like to move the stock, we could only move ten percent of the space. So that's made it uh, even even more challenging. Uh, and then the final the final step is for us to mig migrate it as part of as the future onto our Microsoft Azure environment, and then hand it over to the business team in George to be more the business as usual and we'll help them use that in future. And that's all from us, Asda. So, hope you enjoyed it and I think you'll be able to ask us questions at the end. So, thank you very much, Asda. Yes, do please keep posting your questions on the Padlet. I can see we've had a few already. So, in, in order to keep on time, I'm going to refer us straight on to the Bank of England. So, that's Susie and Ayaz. Please come up and, uh, and give us your talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayaz and Susie from Bank of England. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a background myself. I've been working at Bank for about three years now. Um, my background, I was I studied at the University of Salford the Multimedia Technology. And since then, I've just been in the financial sector, I've been to different banks, uh, worked in various uh, financial industry, but now I'm at the, basically the biggest financial institution in the UK right now. Um, I'll just give, Susie will give a background myself. So. Um, yeah, so my name's Susie. I've been a data scientist at the Bank of England, just coming up to a year now. Um, before I was a data scientist, I was doing a PhD, actually, at the um, CDT of a data, data analytics and society, um, which you might have seen earlier at the slides. Uh, I wasn't based in Leeds, sadly. Um, I was over in Liverpool. Um, I wish I was here. Just say I'm just going to eat. Um, and yeah, so I did my PhD, which was looking into the relationship between footfall and cities and retail. Um, and yeah, and then I decided to become a data scientist at the Bank of England. Yeah, so I'll give you a bit overview of Bank of England. Bank of England is not just, um, you know, it's not just produce uh, banknotes that people might be a misconception of. Um, it does, um, like, it does a, lot, a, big, quite a big role in terms of maintaining stability of financial sector. Uh, the, the, it's spread down in about four different sections. So monetary monet policy, that's where uh, the Bank of England is responsible to, um, to make sure it manages the money supplies accurately. Uh, interest rates to achieve you know, the, 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 the government level inflation. Uh, the financial stability, the Bank of England shows that um, UK financial system and works very smoothly. All the monitors, all the issues that risk might have in our, you know, in our data in terms of how, how people are behaving, how people are spending, how, bank, how different um, you know, businesses are lending money and stuff like that. So we just keep a very close check on that to make sure how we're going to predict our you know, future inflation rate or interest rate, I just say. Uh, bank also regulates all the other banks and financial sector in our whole UK and where we make sure they are you know, following the guidelines that we banks itself sets and make sure they're not, you know, they're reporting in the right sector and, and departments and if anyone, are, you know, not doing anything they're supposed to, we can, you know, go back to them and just get, get that corrected. Um, and then lastly, the most important, the issue bank knows this could be, um, and uh, thus, you know, obviously, it makes sure it's high quality, it's not no conflict involved and it's mainly involved in uh, England and Wales only. I'm going to pass it on to Susan. She's going to talk a bit more about data science itself um, at Bank of England. Yeah. yeah so I'm going to so. talk a bit about uh, data science at Bank of England yeah. uh, now. Uh, so data science and AI are increasingly used in financial markets. Uh, this technology can include machine learning, AI, other advanced analytical methods, models, and systems, um, and can be deployed for a range of use cases from sort of process automation to like natural language processing, computer vision, deep learning. Um, this is just an example of some of the some of the articles 
um, in the news about different financial institutions uh, using expanding their data science offering, using data science, um, applying data science to improve their processes. Uh, you've got a bit us with the FCA right at the bottom there, machine learning in UK financial services. Um, you've also got HSBC testing new AI system to tackle more sophisticated crime. Um, an article, the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil but data. Um, how, how AI might change the way you manage your money. Um, some of you might have accountants at a bank like Monzo, for example, who now are using AI to help people budget, to help people manage their money better. Um, and we want consumers to be able to benefit from this digital innovation and this competition. Um, but we also need to make sure that consumers have the confidence that they're getting fair access, price and quality, and that these firms using these methods are acting in their best interests. Um, and where decisions are taken by financial services and firms using these data-based or algorith algorithmic methods, um, we need to make sure those decisions are transparent, fair and secure, and the data is used ethically. Um, we also need to understand the impact their decisions might have on different consumer groups, in particular those who are most vulnerable. If I'm looking down here, I've got my notes. So please excuse me for that. It's like amazing, got it first time. There we go. Um, so I'm sure you've seen many graphs like this before uh, today. And as time goes on, we're now getting more and more data. Um, this is structured. This is an example of the average data points submitted over time for the Bank of England. You can see how it's gone up and up and up. And this is a bit of out of date graph. I couldn't find a more recent one. Um, it's continued to go up and up and up. Um, and this is just the kind of data which is submitted in a structured format. There are also sort of alternative sources of data, for example, social media, product reviews, uh, news, Google search trends. That kind of data um, can also be a valuable resource um, which we can learn more about. And with this more data, we've also got more data, new approaches, um, new methods, I'd say. Um, hopefully, maybe you recognised some of these methods on here. Maybe you don't. That's okay too. Um, so, looking at sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, neural networks, um, time series, decomposition time series methods, with all these kind of new approaches, there's so many opportunities for innovation in general, also in the financial sector. So, how does this relate back to the Bank of England? I, as before, said some of the, um, some of the kind of key roles of the Bank of England. Um, we. We set, the, we set the bank rate, we t attempt to control inflation, that's one of my main jobs, also to make sure that people's money is kept safe, um, that banks are investing in things which uh, banks are using their money in a sensible way so we won't have any financial crisis or crashes. Um, we also put the money just <laughs> aside there, but like, how does that relate to data science? And over a year ago, before I started working as a data scientist at the Bank of England, if you'd have asked me what does data science at the Bank of England look like, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. I, I was like, I don't, I don't know how data science relates back to all of this. Um, but data has been at the heart of decisions made at the Bank of England for a very long time. Um, we collect data from financial, different, all different financial institutions in order to regulate them, to make sure that they have their money in the, in the, kind of the right places, to make sure they're holding your money safely and they stick to certain regula regulatory guidelines. Um, and we also use data about people in the country, how they're feeling, their kind of, um, how they're using their money, where their money is, in order to make decisions to, for the benefit of everyone in the country. Um, so we, not only do we collect data from all kinds of financial institutions, mortgage lenders, credit unions, we also provide data to the ONS, the um, Offer Office, national statistics, the IMF, the European Central Bank, and we also publish data which is freely and openly available on our website. Um, and on top of that, we also have a lot of research priorities which focus on the economy, economic trends, um, how, how, people, how people are coping, which I'll go into a bit later. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to kind of do a quick whistle-stop tour. We're not going to go into too much depth. Um, I'm kind of going to go broad and hopefully you might find something which might pique your interest. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the research and data projects at the Bank of England. Okay, just quickly, so all the kind of stuff I'm going to present and talk about, uh, these are all papers which, or papers or pieces of work, blog articles, which you can look up today, all freely available, publicly available, um, from two sources. So there's Bank Overground, which is the name of our 
staff blog, so any kind of research which has been used to make decisions. There'll be someone would have written up a little piece, you can very quickly read about it on Bank Overground. It's very, um, very digestible, very easy to understand. And there's also staff working papers, which are in a way similar to like academic papers you might read um, for your studies. And these are also available on the Bank of England, kind of goes a bit more depth um, of research which we've done. Um, so first one, forecasting inflation. Very, you think about the Bank of England, think this is actually something they might do. They might want to know how inflation's going. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Um, hopefully down at the moment. <laughs> but so this is one of the research papers uh, which from the Bank of England, um, looking into the most effective methods for forecasting inflation. We aim to forecast inflation for six months to one year ahead to allow us to make decisions about monetary policy. Um, so this, this staff working paper compares different met methods for achieving this, um, and it actually finds that the autoregressive uh, time series approach they were using, actually that a rig ridge regression um, produced met better results when looking at the shapely values, um, but they also found that sort of different methods are better whether inflation is going up or going down. Um, so that allows us then in future to make more accurate, uh, more accurate predictions. COVID impacts, another, another kind of research area. So did COVID-19 local lockdowns reduce business activity? Evidence from UK SMEs, SME, by the way, I have had to Google this. It stands for small, medium enterprises. It's, it's small businesses, basically. And you might think, why, why does the Bank of England necessarily care about this? Well, if you kind of think about it a little bit, a lot of people who might open a small, medium enterprise, small, medium business, um, they'll have a loan which they've taken out from a bank. So if their business goes down, the bank then loses money. And it's important to think about how that might then impact if then loads of, sorry, loads of small medium enterprises uh, collapse, then that might actually have quite a big impact on that bank. And it's important that we know when banks might be in trouble and they might need the Bank of England to step in. So that is, that's why we might be interested in this. Um, so, this, uh, this paper used a spatial regression to compare different small medium enterprises and kind of did a comparison between ones that were under different lockdown restrictions to isolate the impact specifically of lockdown restrictions of policy to see if it had any kind of what impact was compared to a baseline. Um, and they did think that there was a causal link, but perhaps it wasn't the only thing to consider and actually small medium enterprises would have suffered even if lockdowns hadn't happened. Um, and they kind of estimated what the, the research showed, um, about two fifths of the, of the kind of money they lost uh, on average for small medium enterprises was as, um, was as a result of the lockdowns. Um, there's also an example of how firms views on financial stability risks have changed since the COVID pandemic. Um, so this is a blog post on Bank Overground um, and this basically was the results of a survey. Um, so the Bank of England surveyed different financial institutions to ask their opinions on perceived risk of financial stability. So um, what did they think? What did they think were the biggest risks to financial stability and how has that changed due to the COVID pandemic? And they found maybe, they found their results were that yes, people thought the lockdown and policy was more of a concern since COVID happened than before. Um, but they're also talking a lot, thinking a lot about risks of climate change and cyber security as well. Cost of living crisis, very much in the news. I'm sure you've heard about this. Um, so this is a piece of work which looking about how the increase of cost of living has affected different UK households and what does that mean for the economy. Um, so this was basically a survey trying to find out how people have managed their finances to survive through the cost of living crisis or currently surviving through the cost of living crisis. And they found that most of most people, so over half, have actually cut their savings in order to survive the cost of living crisis. Um, so they are deciding to save less, but they're not dipping into their savings yet. A quarter of people have had to kind of dip into those savings in order to make ends meet. Um, and there's 5% of people who have increased borrowing, so they've had to take out a loan in order to, in order to kind of, um, in order to make ends meet. Uh, why is this important again? Well, we need to understand the Bank of England. We need to understand how many people might want to be taking out a loan with banks, like how many people will be saving and how, what that then means to interest rates. If we move 
interest rates up, we want to encourage people to save. If we move them down, we want to encourage people to take out money, to borrow money. So understanding how that's actually translating into people's attitudes is very important um, to understand when we're making these big decisions. I'm not making these decisions, by the way. Um, when the people at the top are making these big decisions. Um, also an article on how are the rising cost of living and interest rates affecting households' ability to pay their mortgage. Another kind of link to banks, that one of the, one of the kind of, um, we think about, we've, been, we've recently, maybe if you're not aware of this, we've been increasing the bank rate slowly, which means interest rates have gone up. So if you've got some savings, you're, they're now, you're now making more money off them than you would have been a few years ago. But if you've taken out money because you have a mortgage, you might now potentially be paying more off that mortgage um, because the interest rate is now higher. So this is also an important thing for us to understand. Uh, we, this kind of goes into the detail about um, modeling how many people will default on their mortgage if certain financial conditions happen, uh, which is really important to understand because we want to know how much banks, banks would lose, how much mortgage lenders would lose if X situation happens. Um, and the Bank of England is really uniquely placed to do this analysis uh, because we have the data from all regulated mortgage lenders in the UK. They all submit their data to us, so we have it there to analyse to help make these decisions. Um, and we want to know how many people will be at risk and if the UK banks are strong enough to absorb this risk. Climate and the environment. Uh, this is another thing. When I found out the, um, the Bank of England did research in climate and environment, I thought that was... That was really cool, it was really interesting. I didn't expect this. Um, and yeah, and as someone, I, my, my original degree, my undergraduate degree is in geography. Um, so this is something which, even though I'm not kind of working in climate environment field, is still quite close to my heart. So it was really good to see that an institution like the Bank of England is keeping the kind of, um, the future of the climate and the environment and also how that relates to economic strength in mind and is to actively doing research on these topics. Um, this is an interesting paper, so it wants to understand um, climate-related disclosures of UK financial institutions. And what this piece of work does um, is it basically takes lots of different reports which, um, which firms have published on how they on basically disclosing the kind of environmental, um, environmental decisions they're making, and it uses natural language processing techniques to analyse this, to understand which firms are kind of disclosing more, which ones are disclosing less, um, and then we can use that to kind of, to, in order to make decisions to potentially encourage certain firms to disclose more to meet certain like um, net zero climate targets. Um, there's also, sorry, there's also a paper. I'm talking a lot to make my make my throat dry. Sorry. Um, there's also a paper on the effects of subsidised flood insurance on real estate markets. Again, the housing market is such a key part of the UK's economy, so interlinked into the um, into banks and their stability. So it's really important to understand um, the kind of increase in floods, which might be a result of the climate change, and then you then get more subsidised flood insurance. So this kind of paper explores what is the effect of this policy, what is the effect of subsidising flood insurance, because there are more floods now. Um, how will that actually impact real estate markets? Who will be the winners? Who will be the losers? Um, people can actually found the people with houses that are worth more. Um, they won't. Um, they won't be impacted by this. But um, people with houses, which so they might get their flood insurance subsidised, but actually their housing value goes down. So it kind of has a net negative impact with them anyway, even though it is being subsidised. Um, and then we'll talk quickly about risk. I think this is one of the last ones, almost there. I ho hope you found something which has been a bit interesting. I know I'm kind of going through quite quickly. Uh, lots of different topics, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully you found something which might be interesting to you. Um, so this is another one which I, I found particularly interesting, is this paper, Quantifying Culture and Its Impacts, Implications for Bank Riskiness. Um, so the kind of riskiness of banks and the kind of culture around banks is often blamed um, when certain financial scandals happen. Uh, if a bank fails, you kind of hear articles after being like, oh, they had a risky culture, they were taking chances they shouldn't have taken. Um, well, how can we actually quantify that? How can we understand, um, how can we use that to kind of quantify that culture? Like that's, that's a, how do you quantify culture? That's a really interesting question. Um, and these analysts have taken a stab at it. They want to, they've tried to quantify uh, riskiness in cultures, they've used um, regulatory data and how 
punctual and accurate firms are when submitting their data to us. Um, also combined with uh, the kind of representation of gender ages at the higher levels within the company. Um, also data on consumer complaints, so how many complaints they're getting, uh, what are the value of them and then what are the outcomes. Um, and also sort of fraud detection and whistleblowing, how, how quick are they to say when things like that have happened, how quick are they to report when things have gone wrong, and also their kind of risk appetite. Using all these factors combined, uh, this paper kind of makes a figure which quantifies um, how risky a culture of a certain firm is. And this found that this was, um, yeah, that this would help predict this, if they applied this kind of in past data, they found that this actually was a very good predictor of certain firms uh, which failed in the kind of next few years. And um, there's kind of another, another sort of similar bit of research here, so predicting bank stress with machine learning. Um, so using this kind of confidential regulatory data between 2006, 2012, so capturing the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, right in the middle there, we used information about this kind of this old data, and you compare different machine learning methods to kind of find the best sort of prediction for the banks which are going to suffer. So they kind of compared um, random forest model, uh, classification model, XG boost, kind of K nearest neighbors, support vector machines, and the logistic regression, and found that the random forest was the best model in order to predict which banks uh, would which banks failed the financial crisis uh, we now know but like but making sure that we can have a model which predicts that well means we can use that model to go forward um, to potentially predict these things and stop them happening in future um, and it's talking a little bit about automating processes and problem solving um, so this is kind of the side, this is kind of my work, sort of, I, the work I do fits under this. Um, and basically, uh, the job is to kind of create analytical pipelines uh, with different tools I have. Hopefully you recognize some of these. These are the sort of analytical and technological tools we use at the Bank of England. Um, so like RStudio, Python, Apache Spark, uh, Git, um, it's been in code there. And, and also um, on the kind of front end, our Shiny and Tableau, particularly, uh, we use at the bank, also our Markdown. Um, so what is creating an analytical pipeline? So we have still quite a lot of processes within the bank, which are very much point and click. I'll give you an example of this, is um, plausibility checking firm submissions. Uh, so my, I've talked quite a bit about how many firms, so we get lots of data in all the time from all different firms. And we want to make sure that that is right, that the data they're submitting, and that there's nothing there which looks wrong, um, if there is, we have to go back to the firm and ask them, can you check this? Is this correct? Please, can you resubmit if it's wrong? Um, but if we had someone sit there and manually check every single submission to find the number which looks wrong, we'd need a lot more stuff and they'd be very bored. <laughs> so this is a perfect candidate for an automated process. Um, and this is the kind of automated process which I work on, uh, which is called the plausibility process, the plausibility of certain of data points, and basically it's a classification machine learning model um, in order than trying to classify things which look wrong. So we have a bunch of data which analysts has la have labeled previously as this looks weird, we went to a firm, they said yes, it's wrong, and they resubmitted their data. We can use all this past data to predict things which will look wrong in future. Um, so there's a pipeline which goes from the submission and entry of the data all the way uh, and yeah, uses, applies these machine learning models to pick out which of those data points are gonna look the most weird. Um, it's difficult to say, it sounds the most weird, but yes, yeah, the most weird, the most probable of being wrong. Um, and then we have analysts review just those top results, um, raise those queries with firms, and then hopefully get some resubmissions. And we do every round get some firms which have made a mistake, put a few extra zeros somewhere they shouldn't have done. Um, and we kind of catch those mistakes. Um, so just going to quickly talk about the Bank of England, which areas within the bank do data science. This is the Bank of England. It's all right. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of trees. It's a very wide institution. Um, but the kind of key areas where data science is done is DAP, which is the Data Analytics and Transformation uh, section, which we're both part of. Um, and also, there's kind of a new data science book in authorizations, reg tech, and international supervision. Um, 
So we'll talk a bit about that in a second, uh, but this section, RDI, I couldn't find their little graph. I don't know, I don't know where it is, I couldn't find it. Um, but these, these people are sat within the PRA, and the PRA's job, they're the ones who know in details. You have supervisors, and you might have a supervisor for Santander, you have a supervisor for HSBC, all the kind of big banks have their own supervisors. And these guys are experts, they know everything that's going on with a certain bank. They're the ones who are poised to say, when something's gone wrong, poised to make those kind of decisions. Um, so the data scientists who work under the PRA, their job is to make tools that will help supervisors make these best decisions. For example, um, I know that there's a tool which basically uses tweets, um, and each supervisor has their own dashboard which shows uh, what are people tweeting about your firm at a certain point? If people are tweeting a lot about your firm, is it good or is it bad? That kind of tools, those are, those are the kind of tools they make in, uh, in reg tech. Uh, Rate tech data innovation, RDI, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of acronyms in the bank. <laughs> um, but this is DAP, so the data analytics and transformation section. Um, there's three sections under DAP, so there is the data and statistics division, where we both that. Um, and this is the bank center of expertise for compilation, dissemination and publication of regulatory and statistical data, promoting innovation and quality to support analysis and decision making, made by the banks, committees, UK government, and international organizations. You can tell I'm reading this up <laughs> there, like on the, on the website, this is what the areas are. So I don't get anything wrong. Um, Cause I already work in this area. So I, <laughs> I'm learning a lot about the other areas as I made this PowerPoint. Um, so there's also the DCID, which is the data strategy implementation division, uh, which is responsible for leading the bank towards the goal of planting the full power of data analytics to meet the bank's mission. So these are the guys who are kind of come from new ideas of how to how to apply things. Um, they're the ones who are who are saying these are the rules we should stick to when we're making a new pipeline. Um, and this is uh, so it leads on the delivery of external review into data collection, uh, having published a discussion paper transformation data collection for the UK financial sector. Uh, there's also the advanced analytics division. We talked a bit about some of their work earlier. So this is the bank's center of expertise in the use of cutting edge analytical techniques, in particular AR machine learning models. Uh, these are our researchers, our kind of cutting edge data scientists, we bring into projects or other areas of the bank uh, to work on and help, help, um, help upskill some other areas of the bank. Uh, so it partners all other areas of the bank to produce high quality research, develops reusable models to increase efficiency in the scope of bank analysis, and works with our technology hub to enable the analysis of large data sets. Um, I think that was everything. I'm not sure if I pass over to you to talk yeah, about so I'm going to talk a little bit careers of Bank of England. So there's various pathways. Um, in Bank of England, they are structured into like the four different levels. Um, analysts who analyze data, associates that work with analysts um, in terms of to analyze data, the managers who are managing all the big teams, and the senior managers that are in charge of the, our whole division who are making sure um, everyone's doing the job correctly and they need help, they can they go to the right people to you know ask answers. And like, you can imagine the bank itself is a quite big uh, organization. Sometimes we need help with uh, other uh, departments such as we have to work sometimes very closely to PRA where they base a decision on, on their you know, interest rates and stuff like that. So they can help us in go to the right you know, navigation. Um, uh, but employees are uh, basically assessed on different merits, like uh, on depending on the performance at the end of the year. Uh, we, we, we all, depending on how well you did, how much you achieved the objectives, you get um, some bonuses um, at some time, uh, depending if, you, if you're doing well. Most time you do, uh, because we are all good employees, I guess. Um, um, and they have a lot of very good uh, benefit packages that allows you to uh, get health insurance, um, you know, extra um, you know, holidays and stuff like that, which is very helpful in, in terms of, you know, if, you, if I put myself, that's my favorite part because it, it allows you to buy packages or things that you might need, but not necessarily coming out from your uh, uh, pay, pay itself. Um, and it does very when I do the good one thing I really enjoyed when I started the bank is the hybrid working. First, I didn't understand how accommodating it is, but over time I realized a lot of people 
um, you know, work from home, but they, they, they feel like it because we all are you know, um, responsible for our own work. If we are doing our job correctly, if you are the day, the manager is not concerned about where you do it, how you do it, as long as you get your work done at the end. So that's very, um, you know, promote, they promote that very, very, you know, culture very young, because especially people with childcare, they understand that a lot more better because they're able to go pick up their kids and they come back and come back to their desk. They are, they're very common in that sense. Uh, there's different ways, career programs. Uh, you can join the banks. The, the, the first one is industry placement, where you, you know, while you're working, you know, while you're studying at university, you can join a bank uh, for the year, and I, I just I get opportunity to you know work in a particular project you might be interested in, and just learn and by you know working with the professionals that are working directly in that project. There's a practice program which is um, a lot of big um, you know institutions do that. We have that as well, where you pay the distance, you have a, de a degree, you can join as an apprentice and to learn on the job and develop your uh, skills and move on to different departments within the bank itself. Um, the most popular one that I've seen is graduate program, where a lot of people join because um, people are interested in economics. They join um, as soon as they finish degree, they come join, they, they study further, and they were working with different departments depending on uh, where your interest might lie. It could be markets, could be data analytics, wherever you, you be, the bank has a wider range of. And we also have experience. High, obviously, if you are, you know, in, in been working in economics or any financial sector for X, uh, 20 years, you can work, join a bank, and be part of our uh, vision and you help the you know financial stability. Um, the career program is a, is a very excellent project for people who want to pursue uh, their interest in the career in finance, economics, and work, and, uh, and just want to be part of Bank of England, um, and. Uh, Bank itself is very uh, open to inclusion. They, have, uh, I've seen, is uh, people from all different backgrounds, people from all different um, needs. Um, they, uh, they're very um, uh, supportive and they're always inclusive in terms of how how they want to work, work, how they work, and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, to apply, you can either go onto website, uh, which is Bank of website, or where, where I've personally um, applied via LinkedIn. Also, um, in, in, uh, indeed, sorry. Um, and then people do join the bank within LinkedIn as well, so because that's where we communicate with you know our different uh, people. People from uh, each each month we have we have people joining from sometimes Germany, sometimes from Sweden, because they are all constantly looking at our careers at the bank, and they they want to uh, you know help us make the best decision in the bank and the Bank of England. Um, the conclusion: we obviously bank itself has a rich history. It has a very you know prestige work. Um, I know it sounds prestige, but when you join, when you work in a bank, you don't have to wear a tie or a suit. You can come in however you are. As, as it. When I went in, I, was, I had to buy like five different suits and I never wore it again, um, which is uh, a shame. But I guess hopefully get opportunities to wear that. So that's one thing um, I was quite um, shocked about when I especially joined the bank. Um, obviously, the uh, mission is for bankers uh, to maintain the monetary and uh, financial stability in the UK. Uh, give employees the sense of uh, purpose that what they're doing, that, what, that whatever job they're doing is, a, is an impact not directly to the bank itself, impacting the uh, audience outside, those which impact everyone's life. Um, culture, we all have, like I said, is very supportive, inclusive, encourage people and in terms of developing their skills. Um, uh, when, I, when I joined, I kind of stopped looking at the data sciences sort of uh, my career, but uh, as I joined, a lot of people around me, they all um, with little no experience in the data science itself. They all started learning by LinkedIn learning. We have regular um, uh, teachings with uh, beginner for beginners, like learning for alpha beginners and Python. So we, you are you are uh, openly uh, everyone. It could be, uh, managers as well. They, they encourage you to go to them and learn a bit more, even if you just in terms of running the code itself, because that's when. Once you start running it, you understand how the code runs, and then you might want to learn a bit more further from there. So that's where I got back into uh, you know, coding after the uni, because the bank itself encouraged us. And, the, and, the, and, and just generally, when, you, when, you, when you're doing the coding itself, you feel some sort of like um, achievement, like you have made your life easier. It doesn't have to be impacting just like, 10 people. To be, if it just helps you to do their job uh, better, go for it because that's going to help you spend, save 10 minutes or 5 minutes of your day. So um, that's what we do on a day-to-day basis. We try to find uh, to uh, 
make uh, graphs, makes you know like just da- just terms of data and so on. Uh, like I said, for me, the work-life balance is really great. Um, I pers- I'm initially uh, started working in London. Um, the COVID happened, I moved back home in Manchester. So I'm still working, working home in Manchester, but it allows me to go into London office when I want. Um, the bank itself has recently opened hybrid offices, one in Leeds, there's one in Glasgow, one in Bristol. So um, it allows you to go, to go to them offices if you want to. And it also helps us um, uh, reach a wider audience in terms of getting career. For example, people living in Bristol, you can say, yeah, we have office there. If you want to join us, we, you could be well welcome to. And, and the bank itself, uh, while working in these offices, uh, the bank actually pays for you to come into your main office so you can, um, you know, compensate, like, you, you know, reimburse the money you spend going to the bank main office, you know, interact with your colleagues and so on. So it, that's my, my, my favorite part of the working at, of working at Bank of England as well. Um, that's pretty much it for me and Susan. Thanks for listening. Hope you didn't bore you so much. Uh, but yeah. <laughs>'2nd uh, public service broadcaster um, the first one is the BBC um, and the difference between the BBC and Channel 4 um, is that we are funded through advertising basically rather than the license fee so we are more of a commercial operation in that sense um, there are two main sides to the business so there's traditional telly there's you know turn the TV on see what's on watch your countdown or whatever over your tea um, and we have various channels, 12 of them. Um, Channel 4 is the main one, um, E4 for students, um, and Film 4 for films um, are some of the um, more prominent ones. Um, and then we have the UK's biggest um, free streaming service, um, all four. So that's free in that you don't have to pay for it, but you do have to watch some ads um, so that we can actually um, continue to provision it. Um, And then the last thing to say is that we don't make our own content, so we deal with independent studios um, and commission shows that they pitch to us, um, and they keep the rights for those. So, um, yeah, it's a slightly different model to other um, TV um, networks who will will make their own content. Um, So... The other presentations had quite a few more charts than I had, but this is a Data Institute presentation. I have got one chart for you. Um, And as I said, there are two uh, sides to the business. So the sort of traditional TV channels, talks about Channel 4 and E4, um, that's terrestrial um, telly, and then digital, which is the all four platforms. So think um, Netflix competitor. Um, And the story of TV... Um, in recent years and um, now is that people are watching less terrestrial um, and more like on demand right people don't want to just um, be beholden to the schedules um, and whatever is on um, with you know some exceptions for for sport Um, they want to sort of plug onto a platform and look at you know what's on there and, and, and choose what to watch so this chart shows how that's played out for us over the last five years that I have data for. Um, I've indexed uh, the total number of viewer hours in the two sides of the business to 2017, um, and you can see that the terrestrial side of the business is down about 20% in that time, um, whereas digital is is way up. It's up about 170%, something like that, Um, with a particular kick through lockdowns when no one had anything better to do than watch loads of telly. Um, so 
yeah, I guess this this shows the like the trends in the two halves of our business, um, and our company strategy is to lean into that and um, look to increase, um, continue to increase the digital viewership um, to secure the future of, of the business. Um, and the the thing that this chart, um, this this chart, sorry, no, no, you can see this. I'm gesticulating at it. Um, yeah, the thing that this chart doesn't tell you is that um, the terrestrial side of the business is actually way bigger um, than the digital side so um, this isn't actually as good a story for us as it might look because terrestrial is a far bigger base so losing 20% of that is a lot of viewer eyeballs so we really do need to grow digital fairly substantially over the next few years to sustain the business. So, um, data science, how do we help? Like, we have to um, align our strategy with the company strategy, which is driving the digital side of the business. Um, the background there is the IT crowd. I haven't seen that. Um, that's Chris O'Dowd and Richard Iowadi down in the basement with their laptops, um, which is a sort of metaphor for data science. That's how we're thought of, perhaps. Um, but yeah, two ways that we might do this. So the first one is to increase views, right? Like the main the main function of a TV channel is getting people to watch uh, the content that you put out. So sort of two ways we might do that broadly. One is getting new people who don't have accounts to make accounts and start watching our content. Um, to do that, we work with our marketing teams who might do things like put adverts on buses or follow you around Facebook or um, Snapchat or whatever, right? Um, and advertise there. And then the other side is uh, for people who already have an all four account, um, try and optimize uh, the platform to them. So make it more tailored to them, get them to watch more on their more views that way. Um, and that's done with our product team. Um, so we've got, yeah, a big product team who look after the all four platform. Um, and then the other side of our team is focused on increasing the amount that we earn from each view. So as I, as I said before, um, we're making our money from putting ads um, on the, the platform. Um, we can increase the amount we earn from those ads either by giving advertisers a bit more, right? So we might be able to say, you know, this isn't just a set of eyeballs, this is someone who is interested in football, right? So is more likely to buy, I don't know, whatever, football stickers, whatever you're advertising. Um, or we can do a bit of optimization going to the uh, ASDA, um, the end of the ASDA presentation, we might want to optimize um, the number of ads that um, we show per, um, per view. Um, so anyone when asked will say I want fewer ads um, behaviour doesn't always indicate that and if you've got some particular show that is more appealing to people you can perhaps put more ads on that um, so yeah on that side we're working with our, our sales um, teams um, to drive extra revenue that way um, so I'll just go into a, a couple of projects in very high level um, that show a bit of how we um, how we do these things so the first one is talking about increasing the pounds per view by augmenting viewer data so what I mean by augment is is kind of that example that I was talking about before it's um, it's taking a view and giving a bit more context um, for that view so that the advertisers um, will know that it's more relevant for them and therefore will pay a bit more um, and give us a bit more, yeah, well, we'll make more money, right? Um, so, step one, hire Jimmy Carr. Step two, find a representative sample of viewers and survey them on what they're interested in. Um, so I gave an example before, football, right? But other things we might ask about, like cars, makeup, fashion, you know, anything that an advertiser wants to advertise about, we ask our survey sample, do you like this? Um, and so from that you get the data set that is you know, users and um, interest categories and then it's just binary flags, one zeros, is this person interested in that category? Step two, build a Lego model. Um, 
or alternatively a predictive model um, which might be more useful so we have our um, binary flags for these people are interested in these things um, that's our target we then collect the viewing data for all those people and anything else we have on them so demographic stuff basically um, and try to predict whether someone will be interested in something based on what they've watched on um, on all four um, so like there are some really obvious strong features there right we we run formula one on um, on all four if someone's watching formula one like there's a decent chance they're interested in cars um, some of the content can be more nebulous so you, it really varies um, the, the predictive power of the models for each category can, can vary quite a lot depending on how much it actually relates to our content um, so yeah, that's step two you build these models one model for each category step three is predict and monetize that's um, Craig Charles there that's a, a daytime quiz called money bags um, which is often on in the office it's extremely distracting um, it's quite good um, they have those big bags of money that go down the travel later and you have to, you have to grab them um, which is sort of figuratively what we're doing with our, our great model here um, so how do we monetize it we we use the model that we've built on this subsample that we've surveyed we predict for all users um, and say you know we've got 100,000 people here who are quite likely to be interested in cars we go out to Hyundai and say will you pay us a bit more to advertise to these people they say yes money rolls in everyone's happy like you know everyone's very pleased with us um, so that's kind of quite a high level how we might increase um, pounds per view um, yeah an example uh, then a second project example this is on the other side so increasing views um, recommendation systems are a reasonably large topic um, this was sort of a lot of this work has been driven by Netflix and a lot of what we do is sort of nicking what they publish and put out there because they have a lot more money than we do and a lot more people working on this stuff um, but it's quite a well-developed area um, and the basic principle is you have someone on your platform you want to say watch this and then actually be interested in it actually click on it and actually stay on your platform for a bit longer watch some more give you some more money um, I tend to get my recommendations from Gogglebox um, which shows lots of different uh, content and people reacting to it so you can do it that way but um, that's a bit more manual it doesn't involve any AI um, so how does this work? Uh, collect data points. So the first one is is the viewer behaviour data again. So what have people watched historically, right? If that's going to be the best indicator for what they might like to watch in future. Then view context. So what I mean by that is things like time of day and day of week. So it may well be the case that on Saturday evenings people are far more likely to want to watch a film than they are on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. So if you have that captured in your feature set, your model will be able to incorporate it. Um, train a model. Um, this sort of misses a step where we take what is a very sparse matrix of viewer behavior, I think kind of 20 million viewers, like 5,000 bits of content, very sparse kind of indications of who's watched what. You want to condense that down to a set of embeddings which are just smaller vectors um, that contain more condensed information effectively um, so that your model isn't you know doesn't go wonky on, on sparse information train the model um, the target will be something like did people watch um, each bit of content in a given month when you've used the last year of data as your your training set um, then you use the trained model to get a kind of interest score for all the users. So take it, an example user, you'll rank all of the content based on how interested our model says that person will be in that bit of content. You might then take the top 50 shows um, per our model and then filter out some of them because, you know, it's, it's out of season for Great British Bake Off, so we're not going to recommend that. Um, or this person's already watched Married at First Sight, so we're not going to recommend that to them. 
um, and then pick something to recommend to them and kind of iterate through that list, present them with stuff that the model thinks they'll be quite interested in. And then importantly, you retrain it, right? So we've made this recommendation. Did they like it? Did they watch it? Um, and yeah, you feed back in, go back to the start, usual data science process. Um, of course, yeah, there's a couple of examples of projects. Um, then uh, just a little careers pitch um, at the end. So what I like about our team is um, it's quite good at balancing the delivery stuff that I've just talked about with personal development. Um, two things that are really good at Channel 4 that I've not had elsewhere. One is learning days. Um, every fortnight we have a day dedicated to sort of reading around a topic. We'll do it together as a team. Um, and yeah, everyone sort of goes their own way and then uh, shares at the end of the day so we can all progress our team learning that way. Um, and the other one is cool down projects. So we work on a six week cycle, um, six week sprint cycle. One of those weeks is given over to planning and designing the, the work for the next cycle and the junior members of the team get to um, run their own projects while the leads for the main projects are, are doing that planning work. So that lets the junior members of the team um, learn to plan and design and execute on sort of smaller prototype projects, um, which is, we brought in a year ago and has, has been working really well. Um, the background is SAS, Who Dares Wins, which I don't actually think is that much about sort of team work. It's about, you know, a sort of quite a personal torture, um, which hopefully learning days aren't, but they can be if it's particularly challenging and you're a long way out of university. Um, yeah, and seeing as everyone else did it, uh, our jobs are posted on LinkedIn, so follow Channel 4. You'll probably see them on there. There isn't anything at the moment, but there often is. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me and listening and hope that's been interesting enough. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, excellent talk. So we're a little short of time for Q&A and I do want people to have time to do uh, refreshments and networking. So I'm just going to ask one question to each of our speakers. The rest of the questions... I will share with our speakers and hopefully they might be able to take a few offline, but a popular question um, that's been asked is related to CV tips and the recruitment process. So I'll pass the mic to Asda first of all. Is there anything you want to say about tips on the CV and recruitment? Um, so, yeah, one of the challenges that we've had recently is getting people that are just um, sort of sending their CV out to everybody and not tailoring it. Uh, don't do that. Um, make the Take the time, make the effort. Um, edit your CV based on the job you're applying for, use keywords out of the CV, um, out, sorry, out of the job description in your CV, um, particularly the bits around the person spec and sort of why you're interested in the role, it really makes you stand out from the crowd. Um, it's not so much about having a sexy template as it is about showing that you actually apply for the role because you want it, not just because you're applying to everybody. Thanks very much, good tips there. Um, I'll pass over to Bank of England. Anything you want to say about CV tips or recruitment process tips? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, great. Um, so the Bank of England's application process is quite, um, thank you, is quite unique in a way um, because if you look at any of our open roles, uh, you'll see there'll be three questions which recommend about 400, 500 word answers for. Um, so it takes a little bit of work um, because you'll have to, and these might be questions such as um, what big data challenges are facing financial institutions, very kind of general questions, uh, but they take a little bit of work as the app in the application process. Um, but what I really like about the process is somebody will actually read those answers. They will judge you on uh, the merit of your answers and the work you've done to, to write that out. Um, and you will get people who will just put NA for all of these answers and just shove their CV in and hope that will get them an interview. It, it won't. <laughs> and also just putting like, oh, I have this experience in an answer which has nothing to do with that. Um, 
but yeah, I found that uh, so the Bank of England really emphasises fairness and inclusivity in their entirety of their process. Um, and this is uh, in terms of kind of race, in terms of gender, everything's anonymous, uh, but also in terms of neurodiversity. And one of the things you do if you do get off an interview is they tell you the majority of the questions before the interview. So you have time to really think about your answers. Um, and it really just allows every candidate to put themselves forward in the best light and gives everyone the fairest chance to perform their best. Um, and that's yeah, one of the things I really like about the Bank of England process. Um, and yeah, just look at the job description. It's the main point, same, same, as, um, same as as this point. Uh, yeah, job description, those keywords, put them in your CV. And yeah, and you hopefully won't have that much trouble. Um, yeah, ours is slightly different in that we don't tend to read the CVs particularly closely um, for junior roles. They're, they're a bit more sort of skills based. So um, there's a minimum requirement for any role. Like if, if someone has failed to do the cover letter um, that's asked for, then they won't get through. So kind of similar to what you're saying about Bank of England. Um, but we don't we don't tend to read them that closely for the purpose of avoiding biases, you know, getting too excited about like where someone went to university or, or whatever. Um, we put through to an automated test um, as the first filter. Um, and then once people are through that, um, we do all the interviews remotely um, and they're mostly skills based. So for us at least, it's very much about like yeah, kind of data manipulation knowledge and being able to sort of do that and talk through um, your approach as you go. Thanks very much. So, conscious of time, thanks, you, thanks everyone for coming. Do please take a chance to talk to the speakers outside over refreshments. Uh, let's give all the speakers one more round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Great, we'll see you outside. The refreshments are just out in the cafe area at the front here. <laughs>